Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, CNCF webinar where we'll talk about what's new in Argo Workflows uh, 3.0 that was just uh, released here this week. My name is Henrik Blix, and I'm a principal product manager here at Intuit. And uh, hi, my name is Alex. I'll be doing the demo today. I'm, I'm a principal software engineer and Argo maintainer. So before we go into uh, the, the meat of 3.0, I wanted to give you a brief history of what Argo is and how we ended up where we are today. So Argo is, is a set of Kubernetes native tools for running and managing your jobs and, and applications with Kubernetes. So Argo uh, consists of four different open source projects. We have Argo Workflows, which is the, the, uh, the star of the show today. And then we also have Argo Events, which is an event-based dependence manager. And then we have Argo CD and Rollouts, which are the declarative continuous delivery tools and progressive delivery tools that you can use to manage applications and manage your rollouts in various shapes and forms. Um, Argo started a few years ago. Uh, it was incubated at a startup called Aplatic. Uh, which was then uh, fairly quickly uh, acquired by Intuit. Intuit had a need to build a self-service developer platform and modernize the way we were doing our software development and manage our applications. So Aplatics was acquired and tasked to, to build that. And with Aplatics came the project Argo uh, workflow at the time. As they were building out and as we were building out this, this new developer platform, there was also a need that we realized to have a continuous delivery platform and, and hence Argo CD was born. So Argo Workflow was the first one and then Argo CD came shortly thereafter. And then one of the Argo Workflow users, uh, BlackRock, later contributed Argo events into the project. And as this uh, matured, we also realized the need for progressive delivery and Argo rollouts was incubated about a year later and uh, premiered at KubeCon about two years ago now. Um, about a year ago now, uh, Argo was uh, incubated as a CNCF uh, incubating project. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we filed the PR to be a fully graduated project. So the project has added uh, you know, a lot of features, a lot of contributors, and gone through a lot of uh, maturing just in the last last couple of years here. So we're really excited you know, how far the project has come in, in a very short uh, time. And that's also uh, evidenced by the, the number of contributors and the growth we've had in our star count on GitHub. We're now up to over 15,000 stars. We have almost 4,000 contributors of which over 900 are actually contributed, contributed com contributors uh, either active right now or have contributed in the past code to one of these four, four projects. And we have a very active Slack uh, channel or several Slack channels. Uh, we have over 5,700 members uh, currently. And it's a really good spread in the community around this project from there are vendors that are stepping in and, and helping here that are offering the commercial support uh, options for Argo. We have a lot of users and individuals that are using you know, the, the regular open source versions of this and then all uh, contributing to, to the success of this, this project. And you can see just in the last year, you know, Argo workflow that's the oldest, the most mature of this project have added you know, 50% new stars in, in less than a year. Um, and we've actually done of the 350 releases that we've done in the Argo project over the last uh, almost four years, 50% of those releases have been in, this, in the last year alone. There's been a lot of good growth, both in terms of features, in terms of contribution, and in, in terms of um, stability in, in the, the various Argo projects. And one thing we're, we're also really excited about is seeing how Argo, Argo Workflow in this case is getting picked up by other open source projects and, and building an ecosystem of, of related projects where Argo is used in a, a component. And Argo being cloud native at its core and having a very flexible architecture makes it easy to integrate with, uh, makes it lightweight. It's all container based. So it, it's really 
easy for for others to pick up Argo and and use that as as a you know workflow engine as part of their um, their project. And it's also a a familiarity piece to this, where you know, workflow as code you can use YAML to describe describe your workflows, to describe how you do things, and that fits in nicely with how these other projects you know we have. Uh, platform and framework projects uh, like Kubeflow uh, or Kendro we have Cooler, the uh, which is, which is a uh, uh, unified interface to interact with various workflow engines underneath that's also supporting Argo. So all all these kind of come together and use Argo and support Argo as as a plugin orchestrator underneath. And we're really excited to see this this ecosystem growing it has been growing pretty fast here just just in the in the last uh, last uh, uh, six six months to a year here. I also just want to mention you know in, in terms of the stability and the scale that uh, Argo is used at, at at Intuit as an example since that's where where, where Alex and I work and this platform that I mentioned initially initially that Aplatix was tasked of building we now have 5,000 service developers that are onboarded to this to this platform, and um, with over eleven thousand applications deployed, over three hundred and fifty plus Kubernetes clusters all running in AWS, with with well over fifteen thousand nodes. Um, so it's pretty sizable sizable architecture that we're using uh, Argo for internally here, uh, and we also have a significant um, population of data scientists. Uh, that are using workflow as uh, you know the their their tool for for executing workflows and pipelines and doing their running their ml ml jobs. So so really excited to take this into into the next level here with with 3.0, which is our first major release in a while. So I'm going to hand it over to Alex here now to do some go through and do some demos. Alex, uh, thank you, Henrik. I'm just going to okay. take over the screen recording from you just now. There we go. Good. You should be able to see the slide. Is that right? Yep. Take your silence answers. Yes. So Argo Workflow 3.0 is probably the largest um, release of Argo workflows um, um, since well, 2.0. I expect. Um, and the main area of focus in this is, well, one of the main areas of focus has been around the user interface enhancements. Um, we've actually added around 20,000 lines of either new or, or changed code within the user interface. And I'm going to give you a demo of probably about four or five really new exciting features coming in version 3.0, and also a sneak peek at a couple of features coming up in version 3.1. So the first uh, new feature coming in version 3.0 is, is support for Argo events. We're providing both an API and a user interface for people who use Argo events. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Argo events, um, it is a cloud native and cloud event compliant um, system for consuming and, and tr triggering actions based on events. So a typical example might be a file being dropped into a bucket and resulting in a workflow being executed, or a Slack message or other messaging platform resulting perhaps in a message going to Kafka, for example. And so being able to provide this in the user interface um, is filling out a really an area we felt was really lacking for Argo events because it's quite it's often quite difficult to diagnose issues in a cloud native landscape without a user interface to help you. I mean, if you're ever looking at logs, I'm sure you you never look directly at the raw logs from kubectl. You you go into some kind of logging facility like Splunk to do so. So let's have a little look at the new Argo events user interface. Um, if you're familiar with Argo Workflows 2, you'll probably recognize the same color schemes and layouts here. But what will probably jump out at you immediately is the fact there are a number of new buttons on the left-hand navigation here. Well, I'm going to go through several of these in, our, in this presentation. So the first um, new area here is an area called event sources. Now, if you're using Argo events, event sources is, is the thing that results in some kind of action happening. 
And I, there's a number of different types of event sources, but this user interface not only allows you to create them, it also allows you to update them and list them. So let's create a new one. This is a pretty canonical example of an event source. This one's a calendar event source that will, will create an event in the system at an interval of every 10 seconds. Let's create that. You can now see we've got a user interface. I can expect the calendar and I can go up and have a look at all the different event sources will also be listed in here. The other key resource in the Argo events universe is a, is a resource called a sensor. And a sensor is something that results in an action being triggered as a result of an event source, sending an event over. So two key things, event source, you know, what has happened, and a sensor, what, what needs to happen, what needs to be triggered as a result of that first item. Let's create an event source. Now the event source here I'm going to create is a little bit more sophisticated than the previous um, example here. It contains a two templates. The templates are the triggers. The first template here is going to create an Arco workflow. So the result of this is every, 50, every 10 seconds an Argo workflow will be created. And the second one is a logging trigger, a diagnostic trigger. That'll just print out to the console the uh, contents of that particular event. Let's create that. And again here I can edit this once I've created it. I can have a list of these different sensors. Um, but if I want to go and diagnose an issue, I can actually move into this new view called event flow. An event flow shows um, the event sources, uh, the sensors and the triggers and the actions that result on them. And I can actually enable the event flow view here by clicking on this button. And that will show me every time an event occurs, an animation will show what's going on in the system. And the specific goal behind this, the specific use case is this, just to make it easier to understand and debug issues that are going on with the system. I can actually have a look at these individual ones. I can click on them and I'll get some additional um, options here. This is just a view and I can go into that open edit one. I can also have a look at um, the standard Kubernetes events that may have occurred related to that resource. And I can have a look at the log files here where you can see that I've got some structured logging going on here from the calendar. The same thing also applies for the triggers. I can click on the triggers and I'm provided with additional information here about that as well. And finally, I've got some additional diagnostic information shown on this around the number of messages that have occurred here. So if, I, if I'm not looking at the screen and look away, you can see those numbers go up uh, as a result of it. And then finally, I can even go and click through into those workflows and take a look at the workflow itself and do the usual kind of investigation. So that's a little bit of an overview of Argo events in the user interface, as well as the new event flow capability. Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, some under the hood changes that we made in version 3.0. So Argo Workflow's user interface is built on fundamentally two technologies. One technology is gRPC, and the other technology is React. And React allows you to write two different types of component. One specified as a TypeScript class, and the other specified as a TypeScript function. What we found during our development of uh, Argo Workflow 3.0 user interfaces, we found ourselves wanting to fix a number of kind of pre-existing issues and bugs and things that didn't work particularly well. And what we found when we're doing that is actually it was often much easier to rewrite, completely rewrite an existing class style component as a functional component. It was faster to do that than actually to fix the previous issue, which is a bit of a rebuke of class components, but also I think more really just shows you the power and simplicity of these uh, 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 functional components, how easy they are to write and how easy they are to debug. Okay, I wanna talk about another little um, example of a feature in here. I'm gonna talk about widgets. Now a widget is the way to embed a bit of information about a workflow into other applications. And we have a couple of different kind of widgets. I'll just show you them now. If I go into the view here of my workflow, I am provided with um, slightly different options here at the top of the screen. You can see that there's a new um, logs viewer. That's really useful for anybody debugging logs. It allows you to actually look at the different types of logs from the different containers in the pod, um, allowing you to get a bit more insight into what's going on, not just in your container, but also in the other containers running within the pod. And there's also this new share link. And if I click on this, I will get um, just an example here of the widgets that um, uh, exist for this particular workflow. And these widgets are animated. So um, when a workflow starts operating, it'll, it'll start you know, in the gray state. If it goes becomes failed, it'll, it'll uh, advance to the red state or it'll uh, change the blue state. These are embeddable and you can just have a little look at the URL to embed them here as a preview. Uh, and let's just open that up in a new window. 
And here we go. That's my little widget. I can embed that. If I click on it, then it'll just take me to the uh, workflow itself. Now that's kind of fun. Another, another type of widget is related to the cron workflow. So a cron workflow, just a bit of a recap for people who are not familiar with this, is a workflow that's triggered on a standard cron schedule. So this example here is going to trigger once every minute. If I click on that cron workflow, I'm given a share button here as well. I can click on that. And I've got uh, status badges. And um, in this example, I can see that that was already running. It just went from a blue state to a green state. So that's a good example of this. And this hopefully will make it easier for those use cases where you probably want to build some kind of framework or platform around Argo workflows, but you also want to include some of the more sophisticated and useful user interface elements. And one of the most valuable parts of the Argo workflows user interface is this graph stroke DAG view showing the workflow as it changes and executes. Okay, so that's a little bit of an overview of widgets. The next thing I want to talk about is reports. Now, reports are kind of a new feature. They've been polished a bit in version 3.0, but they came in 2.12. So for many users, if you're upgrading from 2.10 or 2.11, this will be a new feature for you. Uh, the goal of a report, which appears under this reports option down on the bottom left-hand side, is to give you an idea of how your workflow's behavior, or specifically your workflow template or cron workflow template's behavior has been changing over time. And you're provided some options on the left-hand side here. I'm just going to use that cron workflow. Yeah, and I'm provided with two graphs here. The first graph is a duration graph that allows me to determine if my workflow has been taking longer over time. And the second one is a resource consumption graph. Now resource consumption is um, a slightly older feature, it dates back to version 2.9. And each workflow will provide kind of a high level summary of, uh, of the ballpark of the memory and CPU or GPU that, that workflow has used. And that allows you to track cost over time. This is, this, is, um, this is specifically about the amount that was requested and therefore directly correlates to cost. And so you can see, for example, the cost of this one is pretty much stable. Your CPU and memory have, have remained unchanged over time. And this also works if you've got archived workflows. If you're using the workflow archive, this can actually look at back at historical data as well. I think this will be really useful if you've got a long running workflow that's running for a very long period of time or a number of times over a long period. A longer, a long requested feature from uh, Argo workflows is controller high availability. The goal of high availability is if the controller that operates the workflow crashes for any reason, it can take some time for that controller to start back up again. Uh, it has to query all the workflows in your cluster and build some data sets. But also, there may just be some underlying Kubernetes scheduling issue that means for some reason that controller can't start up for some time. So we've introduced a feature that's quite common in other work, uh, other Kubernetes controllers is a thing called leader election. And this basically allows you to scale your controller's deployment to two or three. And when one of those controllers goes down, another one can be spun up. I'm not going to show you this. It's you know very much uh, a terminal level um, operation, but it's relatively straightforward to do. So you add some R back around uh, the uh, a new Kubernetes API called the coordination API, which is how we how we do leader election. And then you just scale your controller to two or three uh, replicas. And typically, you'll probably also use a thing called AZ anti-affinity to ensure each of those replicas is running in a different availability zone for your cloud provider. This means if one of those um, extremely unlikely, sorry, not, let me correct myself, extremely rare but absolutely guaranteed to happen. Availability outage happens. I mean, that will happen regardless of which cloud provider you're using. That will happen to you one day. You'll actually already have two controllers in hot standby in uh, the two other availability zones. And one of those will automatically start up and take over executing your workflows. So even if you have an outage, an availability zone outage, you can st you'll still be able to recover. Uh, another really um, under the hood, but I think very impactful enhancement in version 3.0 is a, a concept called a key-only artifact. And a key-only artifact is defined, is the same as a normal artifact, but rather than specifying the whole set of configuration, you only need to specify um, the configuration related to the key. Let's have a little look at what that might look like. 
see if I can find this example. Key, key only artifact, there we go. So this is an example of the key only artifacts. And the main difference the most users will notice is here under the outputs, I, don't, I only specify the key for my S3 bucket. I don't have to specify the, the entire thing. And the rest of the information for this will be populated from um, either the artifact repository reference or the defaulted configured, uh, configured artifact repository. And they'll be able to read to that explicit key. So previously, if you if you wanted to not include the bucket and other kinds of configuration, you actually also needed to, um, you know, if you wanted to have an explicit key, you would have needed to include that in entirety. And this is very useful for examples where I want to um, use some formatting here in in the workflow. And this also has like a nice side benefit for large workflows that have many artifacts within them that use a large fan out. This actually uses less disk space within Kubernetes to, to create and store that particular workflow. There's a nice uh, side effect there related to that. I'm going to talk a little bit about some upcoming features. Uh, some users are probably going to skip version 3.0 and go straight to version 3.1. And version 3.1 is going to follow quite soon. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have it release candidate available in the next few weeks. And it's going to bring three or four particularly new um, interesting features. And I'm going to talk a little bit about one called data template. So one thing that's always been quite difficult to do in Argo workflows is efficiently create a fan in, fan out, map reduce style job. And data template is a new abstraction that allows you to easily do the fan out part of a fan out job. And I'm now going to show you an example in our user interface here. Uh, for the examples, it's data transform. There we go. This data transformation uh, lists a list of uh, log files in a bucket, and each of those log files then becomes part of the iteration loop. So this allows me to list a bucket and then start up one other step for each item in those buckets. This has loads of really interesting use cases. For example, listing your Python files in a bucket and then potentially running those Python files separately. Um, so let's give this guy an execution here. So we'll, let's just talk a little bit about it first. Here I have the data template. It's marked by data colon. And under that, I have a source and an artifact pass. This, this tells me which bucket to list. So this is the S3 bucket. And this also uses key only artifacts here as well. So I don't need to list the rest of it. And this just lists any artifact in that bucket with main.log. Then that's passed to the next step here. So that'll, that'll print those to standard out. They're passed to the next step as items. The next step, I'm going to perform some processing on those ones. So let's execute this workflow. So first step, as I mentioned, list log files in the bucket. That will go into the bucket and use whatever API method is used. It's very typically a very lightweight method that allows you to list those items in the bucket. And then it'll proceed to create one additional step for each item that was listed in that bucket. There we go. You can see that with the 142 hidden nodes, there was a large number of log files listed in that bucket. And it'll uh, fan those out and do one operation per item of that. You can see how this could be really useful. Your first step could produce a number of artifacts that you want to iterate over. Um, but maybe you only want to iterate over some of them. You know, you can then use that filtering operation to do that. Another new version coming up is uh, expression tag templates. Now, most users may be already familiar with uh, tag templates. It allows you to substitute information from, for example, input parameters or workflow parameters into a particular template within a workflow. Expression tag templates builds on this to allow those templates to not just be plain substitution of variables, but actually fully formed expressions using the expression syntax that many users will already be familiar with. Let's have a look at an example. Now let me walk you through this example. This example contains one uh, DAG template. That's going to iterate over a number of numbers and print out some information and the date. 
The way to differentiate an expression tag template from a pre-existing template is rather than starting with just two curly braces, it starts with two curly braces and an equal symbol. Then the rest of the contents of that tag is an expression. In this case, you can see they've got an array that I'm going to be iterating over, filtering out numbers that are not greater than one, and finally converting that to JSON, which is necessary for with param. And then going to pass that in as a parameter called foo. Let's have a look at that pod zero template. Pod zero template is going to print out some information to the standard to the console. It's going to print out the word hello, followed by the evaluation of this expression. This expression is based on that input foo. It takes it as an integer because parameters normally are strings and multiplies it by 10. So in this example, we've got a list of one and three. We're going to skip one and just have three as the value for foo, and it's going to multiply three by 10 to give you 30. Then it's going to print out the date. But I didn't want to include the entire date. I just wanted to include the year. So here I'm using a template library that comes built into Argo Workflows 3.0 called Sprig. Sprig is a very common template in system for the Go language and provides a whole number of useful functions for manipulating data. And this particular one is for formatting dates. And in, in the Sprig date format function, um, 2006 really means just print out the date with only the year. And that'll be the workflow creation timestamp. Let's execute this and see what happens. Here's my task. And you can see that the, it's only running on task zero. And we can have a little look at the inputs and outputs of this task. Here we can go, as predicted, a single task with a number three. It runs successfully and it printed out, hello, 2021. The final and one of, one of the most exciting features is the introduction of a container set and an emissary executor. Now these are two separate features, but they work extremely well together. And it's gonna be rare to talk about one without the other. The emissary executor is a new executor to add to the existing executors we already have, including Docker and PNS, that basically builds on the lessons learned for those, plus some additional lessons we learned from working with the team behind Tecton CD. An emissary executor uh, um, uses shared volumes to coordinate into process communication. And as a result of that, it, can, it, it allows us to run multiple containers within a pod. Today, you can only run a single container within a pod, uh, but with the emissary executor, you can run multiple containers within that pod and actually have the processes within each of those containers wait for the process in a previous container to complete. This allows you to create a directed acyclic graph of, con of containers within a pod to do processing. And one of, the, one of the great benefits of this is because they're containers within a pod, they can share things like volumes and also communicate together with each other over localhost. An emissary executor on its own is not enough to achieve this. We also introduced a new template type alongside resource, container, and the other types of templates such as DAG and steps called container set. And a container set simply specifies a group of containers that run and the dependencies between them. So let's see this in action. Now there are several examples we can choose from here. And the first one I'm gonna choose is this graph workflow, which demonstrates the ability to connect multiple steps within a workflow. Now, one thing I'm just gonna quickly highlight here is this additional annotation. This is also introduced into Argo Workflow 3.0. In previous of work, art versions of Argo Workflow, you were committed to a specific container runtime executor for all your workflows within, a, within your controller. Version 3.0 allows you to use a label to use different executors. The different executors have a trade-off between power, security, performance, and so forth. And this allows you to experiment with new ones without um, risking the other ones or, or mix and match the ones you want to use for particular workflows, depending on your requirements. As I mentioned, this new feature is based on the idea of container set. And within containers, I list a series of containers and the dependencies between them. Let's, let's start this workflow and you'll be able to see this in operation. Now, one of the things I love about doing the container set demo is it's often extremely responsive. Um, so responsive, it didn't appear to execute. They all appear to execute at once. And I can assure you that's not the case. Because these are separate containers rather than separate pods, they do not have that overhead of waiting for the other pod to complete and the communication by the Kubernetes API and synchronization, they'll all execute as fast as possible. And it's really good for co-locating um, tasks within a single place. 
Let's run another example here, and I'm just going to show you the, the, another one of the benefits here. This container set workflow uses a shared volume specified here that's mounted onto all of the containers on the path specified here. So, so it acts as a shared workspace. And in our example, we're going to have an artifact that's produced by container A, and this can be written into that workspace, but then collected from the output. There we go. And here we go. You should see that this executes extremely quickly as well, typically within uh, a few moments. There you go. That's another example of the container set template. So uh, as I previously mentioned, Argo Workflows 3.0 introduces a number of new features. I'll just review them here for you. The Argo Events API user interface with the event flow view for diagnosing issues and the ability to create event sources and sensors through the user interface. A significant refactoring to improve the performance, reliability, maintainability, and robustness of the user interface. Many users will note that you don't get as many disconnection errors in version 3.0. Uh, control high, high availability through leadership election that allows you to survive availability zone out, even survive availability zone outages. Key only artifacts which simplify the, uh, the definition of a workflow and reports that allow you to look at the history of a workflow, understand how it's changing over time. Then in 3.1, data templates that allow you to fan out workflows based on the contents of a bucket with inside your artifact repository. Um, conditional parameter logic, which I haven't talked much about here, but it allows you to select which one of the outputs of a DAG or steps template um, is passed downstream. Expression tag templates, which allow a lot more flexibility around expressions used with inside your template. And the container set template and emissary executor that allow you to co-locate multiple steps within a pod to take advantage of things such as the ability to communicate over local host or shared volumes. Now, we're still in 20, oh, hang on, are we 2020 or 21? 2021, aren't we? I'm, you know, you spend so much time locked down at the moment, it can be hard to remember. Uh, we're looking forward to some new um, features coming up. So we didn't talk much about this, but earlier on this year, we did do a survey to understand what our users wanted. We got some really interesting and useful feedback from that. And one of the ones that came back is more capabilities for working with Python. A lot of users use, use Python are familiar with it and don't really like working with the YAML that is so ubiquitous with inside the Kubernetes ecosystem. We're also looking at the ability to, to run workflows that span multiple clusters and multiple namespaces. So for example, you might have a build job that builds a container in one cluster. You want to run that in another cluster and then deploy some additional information in another cluster, but yet have that all specified within inside a single workflow. And we think that'd be really useful for both machine learning and infrastructure automation use cases. We also want to look at building a plugin framework that allows for integration and extension, things like lifecycle hooks or the ability to write your own templates. So we talked a bit about container set template today in the new data template. The plugin framework will actually allow users to build their own templates to do whatever they want to do. And we're looking at doing that with um, a new thing called um, HTTP template. And finally, we're looking to improve the whole developer experience for make it, make it easier for people to work within the ecosystem. So that's all I have to talk about around new features in version 3.0 and upcoming features in version 3.1. I'm now going to pass it back over to Henrik to close this session. Yeah, do you want to jump to the last slide? Let's see, I think there's one. So I just want to thank you for, for stopping by and listening to this. I hope I uh, gave you a good overview and got you excited about all the new things that are coming uh, in 3.0 as, as well as a sneak peek uh, on 3.1. So uh, there's some additional information available in the release blog uh, that's available on the CNCF blog. Uh, there's also the Argo website that has more information about the project itself, how to get it. And, and we also have a very active Slack channel. So there uh, is a link here to help you join the Slack channel and join the conversation. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, information being passed around, a lot of good help in, in the Slack channel. So please check out the website, check out the release blog if you want more information about uh, what we just presented on and uh, come and chat with us on the Slack channel if you want more information. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.